semester. I would like to welcome all of you to the fall 2017 semester. Um, as a few people have indicated, I hope you've had some time. And I always say, I never liked it when people said you have the summer off. As a faculty member, I was usually busy doing research and, and catching up and preparing for the next semester. I hope you've had some unstructured time that has allowed you to refresh. And hopefully some of that was away from campus. That's the way I, I prefer to um, welcome you back and hope that you are refreshed. Uh, I would like to welcome all the new employees at CSU Pueblo. So from last year until today, uh, would all the new employees please stand so that we can recognize you and, and kind of get a scope for the new employees in the audience. So please stand. We are a handsome group, so um, thank you for being with us today and um, welcome to our community. I would also like to welcome some special guests with us today and um, I'd like to welcome the community members who are with us. The Pueblo community is um, vibrant and um, very much committed uh, to our institution and I'm just honored to be a part of that community. So if you're a member of the Pueblo community, we welcome you today. I'd also like to thank and welcome members of the, of the um, CSU Pueblo Foundation, um, our foundation members. I see a few of you out there. I appreciate the work that you do. Um, also in the audience are what I would call friends of Tim and Rick and I appreciate you being here. It is our own support group and I'd like to begin um, um, Charlotte Million is with us and Daniel Zieg. Charlotte hired me at William Jewell College in 1983 to be her intern in her office. And um, so I learned how to write from um, an internship with Charlotte. We go way back and I appreciate you being with us today, Charlotte and Danielle. Um, I'd also like, um, Ed Perry is with us today and Ed is, um, if you'll listen to me, I'm acknowledging you now, but um, Ed is a friend too busy talking to Cora, <laughs> not paying any attention. <laughs> also with us today is Antoine Burton, who is a friend of, of Tim. Antoine is part philosopher. He is part NFL player. He is part coach. And he is my trainer three days a week who just um, is ruthless. And I'm glad that you're with us because you're a part of my support team. The rock of my support team is my spouse, Rick Gonzalez. Rick, would you please stand so we can recognize and, and thank you. I'd also like to introduce the members of our cabinet. So the university cabinet, would you please stand? If you're a member of the cabinet, please stand so we can recognize the members of our cabinet. I appreciate all of the work of this group. Thank you. We have. We have spent numerous hours together already. A very special thanks to Nikki Whitaker for all things in the president's office and, and keeping me um, where I need to be. And I appreciate all of your counsel, Nikki. The members of the, the university leadership team, which is the members of the cabinet, but it's also all of our deans, and it is also the elected members who represent the constituent groups that are with us today. Um, this is the group of men and women that I look to for um, charting the course uh, of moving forward with the university and, um, and helping guide that. So all members of the university leadership team, would you please stand? Um, this is a group, if you would give them a round of applause. Again, we have spent a lot of hours together with this group, and I just appreciate the time and their investment. Uh, to make today possible, there is a tech team in the back with Adam Poshis over here in the wings that run all the bells and whistles, and I'm just very much appreciative for their work as well. Today's message is, is, is titled, Writing Our Story Together. And in the two months that Rick and I have been in Pueblo and on the campus, uh, a few observations as an outsider coming in. And a part of that is um, we have a very vibrant story that is nuanced, it's complex, it's rich, it's beautiful, and it's wonderful. And I, 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 we started wondering how many people know our story. Our story is compelling. Because I feel like other people have written a story for us 
that we have internalized as our own, but we did not author that story. But we've, we've accepted it. And so I, I challenge all of us in the room today um, to maybe not accept a story that other people have written for us as a community or for a, as a university, and that we pull together and we write our own story, um, which is a story that is all, already well underway. Um, we would like to add to it today moving forward. But we have what I would consider to uh, an incredibly convincing and compelling and a beautiful story. And I need all of us to author that story and to articulate that story and um, take ownership of it and, and be less willing to accept the story that other people have maybe written for us um, that we've accepted. And so that's, as an outsider coming in, something that I've noticed and I thought that might be a way for me to talk about um, the story that we can write together uh, and I'm going to need your help making that happen. So I'd like to start with, with my story. My story is Rick's story. And I want to talk about that first. And then I'd like to acknowledge your story. And then I'd like to talk about the story that we can write together and kind of walk through that. So my story is um, on the left. Um, I'm a member of a family of six. Uh, I have three siblings. Rick is a member of a family of four. He's got a one sibling. Uh, what both of us have in common is that we were, we were born and um, reared uh, in an agrarian culture on a farm. My family owned our farm in southeast Iowa. They still farm. Um, I call it the old country. I go to my village to see my people. Um, <laughs> it's a village of 500, uh, and it's a farm in I'm the only one who left. The rest of them are around the area and doing what they do, which is farming, which is, is quite beautiful. Uh, but it's, it, so I did that from um, birth until 18 years of age, and I said, I think there's something else for me. I admire farmers and farming. I just didn't want to do that for the rest of my life, and I uh, went to college. Rick's family, is, they're farming as well, but they, are, they don't own their farm. They worked for other farmers as migrant farm workers and traveled the United States picking other farmers' produce um, from, from cantaloupes to, um, to in Rocky Ford to uh, um, cucumbers, tomatoes. Um, this is what his family did. But our two families came together 18 years ago in South Texas. My mom and dad were winter Texans. That's where Rick's family lived when we met um, in a bar in Austin. Um, we realized that our families lived about a mile apart and had lived a mile apart for a number of years. And so we brought the families together and had much in common. My dad was eighth grade educated. My mom is, um, received a high school degree. Rick's father, Chino, um, is, cannot read or write, third, third grade education. Um, his mother had to drop out of school, I believe in eighth grade, um, due to the loss of her mother, and she had to raise um, a, a very large family. So we are, we're a family of first, I'm a first generation college student, um, and our, we have a family that loves us and taught us how to love and taught us how to accept each other. And I want to talk a little bit later on today about what's going on in uh, Virginia and at the University of Virginia, where hate is something that people learn. And we had the privilege of growing up in a family that was not formally educated, but who accepted us and taught us to love. So to love doesn't require an education, um, a formal education. It, it, it is an education, but it does not require a college degree. And what I see going on is um, problematic, and again, I want to leave, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of today's message. Um, Rick found the job at Pueblo in the newspaper. He, called, he reads the Chronicle of Higher Education more religiously than I do. But he opened up the back page and saw the, the, the ad for the university. He called me up, I was in a meeting at Northwest Missouri State University where I was a provost, and he said, Tim, I need to talk with you. And I said, I'm in a meeting, can it, can it wait? And he said, no. It can't wait. And I said, okay. So um, I said, what's up? And he said, there is a job, there's a presidency at, um, at Colorado State University Pueblo. And he said, 
He started reading the job posting to me, and I said, that, it, it sounded interesting to me. Um, his family had um, spent a lot of time in Rocky Ford working. They used to come to Pueblo for a good time. Uh, so this region of Colorado has a great degree of good emotional, I don't know, juju for this family. Um, <laughs> And so we went home, and that night we spent some time doing a deep dive. We read the ad, and I said, I said should we apply? And he said, let's go for this. And so um, we, we applied, and it kind of took off. Um, I, we came here for visits. Um, I've never applied for a presidency before. I don't know how it works, but four visits is a lot, I thought. And after each time of coming to Denver or coming to Pueblo, I would leave on the airplane home, and I would say, I felt myself growing more invested in this university. And the more you grow invested, I kept thinking, I, I hope I get this. Because it was feeling, I was becoming invested in, in you and your community and the university. And I said, I, I really want this. And so I feel fortunate and honored um, to be the president of, of this university and to have you as my colleagues. That leads us to um, this. <laughs> this is a part of our story that many of you are familiar with, and you know, it, in many ways, too many people are familiar with this. But, um, but we we experienced a tragedy unlike anything we have experienced before, and I'm sharing this with you because I want you to know um, we have all been through some incredibly horrible things in our lives and some tough times. We've all experienced tragedy. We've all experienced loss. Um, and we all have a story, and um, and much of that story is is just it's 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 the the sadness and the tragedy. But what we have learned from this tragedy, and I want you to know that this is not our American van lines that caught on fire. Hmm. When I was doing my Google research, just to get an image, I realized, oh, there's another American van lines on fire. <laughs> this one in Orlando, Florida. So um, we'll see where that goes, but I thought it was coincidental. Uh, but you know, we, we got a call on June 11th when our, our truck did not arrive at our, our home with nothing in it. And uh, the lady said, there's been an incident. And so, OK. And you know, I was thinking, okay, flat tire, it's delayed by a week, you know, no big whoop. And then she said, your truck caught on fire, and that we'll be back in touch with you. So what we've learned through this are some important lessons. Number one, the greatest thing that I have learned and that we have learned is this thing called empathy. Empathy is our capacity to feel and to understand where other people's, where other people are in their heads. And it's their capacity, that emotional capacity, to understand where other people have been. And that is something... that we understand. Um, the other thing about this is I've grown to understand Rick better. He's grown to understand me better. But understanding other people. And the other thing that we have learned is how to accept help from other people. This community, my God, everyone showed up on the doorstep. Um, there was, and so we've never lived in a place that is so incredibly um, generous as Pueblo, Colorado has been. So that is a part of our story, whether we like it or not. Um, that's where we are today, and we are working through that thanks to all of you in the community of Pueblo, Colorado. Moving on to your story, all of you have, um, as a university community, you have a story, and you've been through a lot. You've been through a lot of ups and downs, and I do not want to be the new president who comes in and fails to recognize or to validate what all of you have been through, because I have been a faculty member in a department of communication studies with a new president who was all about moving forward and did not acknowledge history or the past or what we have been through. And I just said, I never want to be in that place again. And so I have done a deep dive and I've identified what I think are some of the turning points of this institution. The good, the bad, it's just a part of the story. And so here's a few of them 
that I think are a part of our story, and this list is not exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination, but you've gone through a number of name changes. I do know that. You have a strategic plan that I think is very impressive. So for the men and women who have been working on that strategic plan, I applaud you. That is a strength that the university has. It's a part of our narrative and one that I'd like to build on. The employee layoffs that happened, um, that was a few years ago and um, that did occur and that's a part of our story. Financial struggles, they continue. So the financial struggles is a reality. Um, that's something that we're going to be living through. There's been a lot of leadership turnover at a variety of different levels. So you've got to be exhausted. Another new leader, another new agenda. I get that. Um, experiential learning, I believe, is a, a part of the ethos of this institution. I've learned that a lot of us have great pride in this, and we should. And so this is, a, this is a, what I would call a core competency of the university and one that um, we can build on. Declining enrollments have been occurring. And um, enrollment has been volatile across the country. But we're feeling a declining enrollment. We're becoming a smaller university. And that's got to change. And that will change. That will change. And I, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. We have very strong strategic partnerships. I think they're, they're rock solid. Uh, we have a national championship, and hopefully we have more of those in our future. We are designated an Hispanic-serving institution. I'm incredibly proud of that, and that was one of the leading drivers of us coming to Pueblo, Colorado, is we wanted to be a part of an Hispanic-serving institution. All of my 18 years in higher ed, with the exception of three, have been in an Hispanic-serving institution, and I'm excited about that. We have infrastructure enhancements that I think are, are to our advantage. Our physical plant is incredibly strong compared to where I come from. Our buildings, uh, it's, 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 an, it's a handsome campus with a good, good set of bones. And we have an institute of cannabis research, which is also going to be a differentiator for us. So this is a part of your story. You've heard a little bit about my story. This is a part of your story. What I know about your story is that you have endured a lot. And your endurance reflects back on you and it becomes a quality that we all have and we share. We are a community of CSU Pueblo who endures. And you should feel very proud of your ability to endure uh, because it's a part of who you are. And um, I'm proud of that and that's who you are and that that is laying a very strong foundation for where we can go. So the story that we can write together, I'm going to lay out some ideas. In no way do I want you to think that this is a top-down, I'm, 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 I'm laying out what I want us to do. I'm going to lay out ideas, and I want to see how many of these stick, and I need your help in forming these ideas. Um, but here's the end of our story. And this, this we can make happen. Within five years, we will be nationally recognized for our students' success and how this success has positively impacted Pueblo in Southern Colorado. So in five years, I want us to be, and we will be recognized as a university that in a short amount of time, we have noticed this improvement in our university performance. And that includes the following. Our enrollment will grow our retention will increase, the number of students who complete our programs and graduate will be up, and the number of students who get jobs once they graduate will also increase. These are the core performance metrics of any strong university. And we, in five years, with your help, we're going to have and we are going to be recognized for that improvement. So we have five years to make this happen. As we write the story, that was the end of the story. We're going to be recognized for that improvement. But I wanted, let's talk about writing the story. When you write a story, you've got to recognize the context, the environmental scan, what is the reality that is in front of us. And this is the reality that we've got to confront. This is not good or bad. This is just what is. This is a part of our reality. Birth rates are declining until 2021. 
across the United States. This is particularly true in the upper Midwest and the Northeast, but it is a trend across the United States. So the number of college age going students is declining until 2021, and as a result, the number of universities are vying for a, a smaller pool of candidates, which is impacting enrollments. Public opinion about higher education is not good. In fact, it's, 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 um, it's in my career, this is probably the lowest I've ever seen it. Something that I would challenge all of us to think about is we can blame other people for not valuing higher education, but we are part culpable for the public opinion. And I would challenge us on what part of the public opinion are we responsible for and how do we fix it. We cannot put all the blame on an uninformed public and an anti-intellectualism that is a part of our country and has been, but there is a portion of this which we are responsible for. I'd like for us to recognize that and to fix that part of the public opinion. Unemployment in the state of Colorado is at an all-time low. That's a good thing. But as a result of that, people are moving into the workforce and not necessarily coming to college. International climate is tanking. It's impacted international enrollments in a dramatic way. And it's impacting our international enrollment as well. There's a crowded marketplace in higher education in the state of Colorado. The beauty of Colorado is our, our state population is increasing. So that is a good thing. I come from a state where the population is decreasing. So it feels very good to be a part of Colorado where, the, where, where our population base is increasing. And then there's a defunding of higher education across the country. Across the United States, states are getting out of higher education. They're doing this not as a result, they're, they're, many of them are not doing this by choice, but the amount of money that is going into the healthcare and there's only so much money going around and higher ed is still considered discretionary spending with many legislators, with many elected leaders. So there is a defunding of higher ed. Colorado has been defunded for a long time. And so we're not going through the precipitous drops um, that many of the other institutions um, in the other states are going through because our state has gone through this at a little bit of an earlier period. So this is the context. This is, this is what we've got to work with, and that's fine. Um, and we can do that. But here is our opportunity. I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about our unique opportunity, and I get excited about this. This is from the Future of Enrollment. It's a monograph published by the Chronicle of Higher Education, where colleges will find their next students. This is pulled directly from that monograph. The biggest growth in the next decade will be among first-generation, low-income, and Hispanic students. All groups who tend to have lower test scores and are unable or unwilling to travel far distances for college. This is our opportunity, and this is huge. This is another part of our opportunity from the Colorado Department of Higher Education. Colorado has the second largest degree attainment gap in the country, that is the gap between the educational attainment of white students and the attainment of the next largest ethnic group, which in Colorado is Hispanic Latino. This, ladies and gentlemen, is another big opportunity for us because of our location. Take a look at this slide that came from the same report. You can see the gap between uh, the, the, the whites' attainment of a college credential that compared to Hispanics, African Americans, Native Americans, and Asians, but you can see that. So it's 18.13% for Hispanics, whites it's 53.03, blacks 32.15, um, Asians are 53.07, and Native American 28.25. So we have an opportunity. When I take a look at our community of Pueblo, Colorado, where the, the average annual income I had to wrap my head around this, is about, I think, 20, I've seen a variety of figures, 25 to 35 is the annual income. When I take a look at the, um, at, at the demographics of our city, they are talking about us. Kim Hunter-Reed, the executive director of the Department of Higher Education for Colorado, needs us to get this right. Because if we get this right, 
the rest of the state of Colorado is going to benefit, and they are looking to us to get this right. I have heard that from state leaders that they need us to lead and to help develop a model to make this work. And all of you have been here for, a, some of you have been here a long time. This is not your first rodeo. And you probably have some ideas about how we can make this work. From the Brookings Institute, a study from 2014, CSU Pueblo ranked second among all four-year institutions in the state of Colorado in terms of the value-added benefits it provides to its students. So the cost of the degree and the return on that investment is huge, and we rank number two. This is also an important one. Raj Chetty, senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. Colleges with the highest upward mobility rates are typically public, regional, comprehensives that have large numbers of low-income students. We're not talking Ivy Leagues. We're not talking the flagships of every state. We're not talking about Colorado State. We're not talking about the University of Colorado. What this economist is talking about is regional comprehensives universities. He's talking about us. Public comprehensives are the colleges we should be looking to as models as we think about how to give more students pathways to upward mobility. So we've talked about our context. We've got challenges. But the opportunities are huge. They are huge. Here's another one. Zipia is a, is a career website and they published this study just recently. Best schools for economic mobility by state. Taking a look at the value of a degree, how much are you investing, and what is the potential once you get your degree based on the earnings that our alums make when they move into professional practice. In the state of Colorado, we ranked number one for upward mobility. So there is, there's much good, and there's much promise, and there is a huge opportunity, but we've got to take it. If we don't, other people will come into the marketplace, they will figure it out, and they will take our market share. They might be doing that already. And so it is our responsibility to make that happen. So I've been thinking about, in the two months that I've been here, I've generated the list after talking with a lot of people, after listening to a lot of people, after doing a lot of reading, after talking with a lot of community members, I've pulled together a list of university priorities. And this was the list I generated. This list has been refined, and I'm asking all of you, it's been validated by the men and women in the first row, but I'm going to ask all of you to help validate this list of priorities. Um, they're not in any order, by the way. So these are not in any order. These are all important. But what I would need for you to, to think about is what's missing from the list, what do we need to add? What do we need to take away? But thus far, this list has been validated with a variety of different stakeholders. So here's what, these are the chapters that we need to write in our book moving forward. We need to develop our people. Um, we need bench strength. And we've got to invest in training and developing our people. We've got to create a differentiated vision. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. We've got to increase our financial sustainability. I would encourage you to look at the HLC report that is published on the president's website. It's our reaffirmation report. We were reaffirmed, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is huge. So for those of you in the audience who are responsible for that, and I know Helen and, and a group of others, uh, and there's a big team, um, that is a huge success, is the HLC reaffirmation. So congratulations. In that report, talk, yeah, let's do a round of applause for that group. The institution I left, we were just getting ready to do this. So when I came here and learned that you were just finished, I was going, Whew. So Helen, it was, you headed up this group, is that correct? Yes. So I, I thank you and your team for making that happen. But in that report, um, the HLC um, group, they talk, they have some concerns about financial sustainability, and we, we need to address that, and we will address that. Improving university performance is a part of that. 
Enhancing workplace environment. I've been hearing that. Um, ways that we can enhance workplace environment. Addressing employee compensation. I've heard that. Maximizing organizational efficiency. I hear that one often. And investing in marketing and communication. So I don't want to know today, but as you think of, and these slides will be available, but as you think of other items that are not on the list, or that should be on the list, or should be deleted from the list, I would be interested in hearing from you. We've got to write these chapters. I'm going to highlight two chapters during the presentation and show a couple videos to help illustrate. The two chapters that I'd like to focus on is number one, improving university performance, which we can always do. Um, we've been operating well, but we, there's a lot of work we can do. And then I want to talk about developing a differentiated vision, which you will all be a part of. But before I do that, I want to leave you with, I want to, before I transition, the one thing that I want you to know that I'm always going to be working on is, is the, the compensation concerns. Um, compensation concerns are ongoing, and they are a part of any institution that I have been a part of. There have been compensation concerns, and we have them. They are alive and well at this institution, and I've been studying those. And I want you to know that I'm, I'm working along with the cabinet on how can we address that in a systemic manner that is ongoing, that every year we can chip away at this and address that. So I just want you to know it is, it is really the big cloud hanging over me is employee compensation. And it's going to be there until we address it. And it needs to be there until we address it. So I want, you, I want to acknowledge it. I'm aware of it. Uh, and I'm going to work with the team uh, to continuously to study it and to chip away at it in developing a methodology um, that makes sense and we will include appropriate stakeholders no simple solutions, uh, but it is something that we're going to chip away at and do that. And I just wanted to leave you with that. Chapter one, I'd like your help on chapter one. And chapter one is what I would consider to be kind of a triage. It has a, it has a level of urgency. Um, it's something that we cannot wait until a few months down the road. We've got to start acting on it immediately because we're already working on enrollment for 2018. In the fall of 2018, ladies and gentlemen, our enrollment cannot be down. Our enrollment is going to be flat or it's going to be up, period. And that's a part of employee perf uh, the, the university in, uh, performance where we're all going to have to play a role in this. So here's the performance metrics that play into the bottom line, that play into our meeting the needs of the state of Colorado to educate our citizens. It's in these performance metrics, our enrollment. We've got to continue to enroll students, number two. And we have to enroll the students of Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, we cannot overlook the students in our backyard. We've got to reach out and we've got to go to all 50 states and we've got to go around the world. Don't get me wrong, we cannot ignore the students in our backyard uh, because we need to transform this community and in doing that, that transforms us. Retention, we're currently, I believe, at 60, where's, 66, Maureen, where are we? 66? 66%. Um, that we need to, we, that obviously we need, so every year what that means is we lose about 200 or 250 to 300 students decide not to come back. That really is the new enrollment. That is the new enrollment. And so that, we got to look at that. We've got to study that. There's a lot of you in the audience who have a lot of ideas what to do there. Graduation is our completion rates. 34% of our students complete a degree in six years. Um, we've got work to do, and we can do that. And then finally, placement. Placement is, are our students getting employment when they leave? And I believe, Michelle, we're about 55%. Is that right? About 55%? And we're going to work to improve that as well. So what, what we need is we all need to be moving north in one direction. 
there's a lot of initiatives that, there, that are very important to all of us, but we need all to be going north, and our moving north is our contributions to increasing our enrollment, improving our retention, improving our graduation completion rates, and our placement. And this is the way that I like to look at it. We are the red dots on the left, and we all play a role. So enrollment is no longer the only responsibility of Chrissy Holiday and her team. That is a silo. We can no longer afford to live in a silo mentality. So all of us have got to figure out what is my role in enrollment? What is my role in retention? For the faculty, I, I would challenge all of the faculty to, as you go to your meetings and your college meetings, to ask your department chairs and your deans, what is the enrollment goal for my department? What is, what is our retention rates? What is our completion or our graduation rates? We need to have these numbers in our back, in our, in our, at the forefront so we know what we're trying to strive and what we're trying to do. Um, so on the left, what I've done to, to make this a bit more clear is each of the cabinet members is responsible for forwarding to me a couple of levers that they can pull or push that's going to impact each of these. And they represent large groups of, of, of faculty and staff. And so we're looking for an immediate boost because the immediate boost is needed just for financial sustainability. And this is something that we can do. The ideas have been coming in and we'll be, we'll be, we'll be sharing some of the brainstorming that, is already trans, that has been um, happening, but there's a lot of great ideas. But I need all the employees working toward enrollment, retention, graduation, and placement. And I, I feel very good that we can impact that, which will impact bottom line, um, which will help us in a variety of ways. This is a first semester goal. This is a first semester charge, is for all of us to be going north and thinking about what is my role in enrollment, retention, graduation or completion, and uh, placement. When it comes to graduation, um, that is the completion. I would, I would challenge us, do we, do we have the, are we offering the right courses at the right time? Um, there's a variety, I've heard a lot about waitlisting. There's, there's a lot of tools that we can implement and that we can use that can help move students through and get a degree in a timely manner. And, but we got to pull together and take a look at that and, and do that in a manner that makes sense. So I will, I, we will be needing your help in doing that. Chapter two is creating a differentiated vision. And this, I think, is incredibly exciting. I see this as taking place in the spring semester where we pull together as, an, as a community and we figure out a differentiated vision. How are we going to be different from the other institutions in the state of Colorado? When people say Colorado State University Pueblo, they need to say that's where you go because this is what they do incredibly well. We've got to figure out what that do incredibly well is that capitalizes on our, who are our students and what are their needs. Who are our students, what are their needs, and be thinking about in many ways, our community. So this is critical. Who are our students and what are their needs? And this is not our students from 10 years ago. This is not their needs 10 years ago. It is taking a look currently in our high schools, in our community colleges, and wrapping our heads around the reality of what is coming to the universities. And for a lot of us, that is, there's a moment of learning here that's going to be uncomfortable. Um, they've got to meet a minimum standard to get into the university. And the concept that I've been thinking about is student ready. And student ready is where you take a student where they are today and you move them forward. And here's where they are today and here's where they need to be. And we've got to figure out the methodology to get them from where they are to where they need to go to get a degree. And that's where we all have to play a role in this. The concept used to be college ready. Now, I wanna make this crystal clear. There's going to be a number of students we are recruiting that are college ready. 
College ready means that a student comes to the university, their level set, they all have a degree of competencies and skills, and we're gonna move them, we're gonna move them forward, we're gonna offer the honors programs, all of the rich programming that they deserve. But student ready is taking the college ready and moving him or her forward. Student ready is also taking the student who might be less than college ready. And that's when we have to think about who are our students and what are their needs. And go to the high schools, go to the community colleges, and we've got to figure out that piece and we've got to do that um, together. So the concept I want us to be thinking about is student ready. Taking a student with his or her abilities, develop him or her to their fullest potential. We do that every day with every student. And we allow them to get a high quality college degree. So uh, one of the ways to think about this is on the right is the performance. Other institutions that I've been a part of, they put all their energy on the performance. They, they, they invest dollars in enrollment, retention, graduation, and placement. I want us not to do that. What I want us to do is put our energies here. What are the learning systems that we can develop together? What are the support systems that we can develop together that will meet the needs of our students? Our students are Hispanic. Our students are underrepresented. Our students are first generation. Our students probably need to be non-traditional. The working professional in Pueblo, in Southern Colorado, who needs additional credentials. We've got to figure this out. But if we figure this piece out, and that becomes what we do well, we become known for our learning systems and our support systems. And those coupled together meet the needs of the students of our community in Southern Colorado. And, we, and this is where I need your help. Faculty, I will need your help on the learning systems. And I will need the help of the staff for developing the support systems. So here's some ideas for the learning system. I'm just throwing these out to maybe illustrate, to make this a bit more concrete. A learning focus, advising systems, curriculum, pedagogy, integrated technology, and learning spaces. Here are a few of the ideas that we might explore. Some of these might work, some of these might not work. I'd like to focus on, on the learning focus. And the idea that I had is I've spent some time with this woman. Her name is Mary Helen Imordino Yang. And Mary Helen is at the University of Southern California. And um, she has studied the cognitive neuroscience of learning. There's a short video I'd like you to watch, which just gives you an idea of if we were to invest time in learning about learning. There are hospitals who focus on healing, and there are universities who focus on learning. And we are good teachers, but I believe that if I, if I knew more about learning, I would become a better teacher. And being a better teacher to meet the needs of the students that are in our community. And so I'd like you to watch just a, a, a clip from Mary Helen E. Mardino Yang on the role of emotions in learning. So I just wanted to give you an idea of the, a concept where we do a deep dive as a university in learning, all faculty and staff. And um, one of the ways of becoming a better institution, I believe, is by possibly learning more about learning. Another one that I wanted to kind of mention is learning spaces. Do we have optimal learning spaces and environments on the campus for student learning? Um, this you're very much familiar with. Uh, would, what if we were to replace, um, replace or repurpose Belmont as um, a facility that would include learning studios. So every student who enrolls at our institution, he or she would receive a learning studio with a group of students. Our faculty would teach in an interdisciplinary manner and would, would require group projects, but they would work in a, in a learning studio 24 seven uh, that resembles the modern workplace with the modern workplace tools in the environment. And again, it would be available 24 seven. Could this be a part of a comprehensive campaign? So the idea is learning spaces. 
are the learning spaces compatible with the way we need to teach and the curriculum that we need to offer? The other one is curriculum and pedagogy. Do we have the right curriculum? Do we have the right pedagogy? We start by thinking about who are the students and what are their needs. This is a group of, of men and women that I have met this summer who have worked on a, on a summer bridge program, 2017, from the Maestro program. In my short time here and being a part, I've eavesdropped on what they've been doing over the last five weeks. What this group has done in a very thoughtful manner is they've wrapped their heads around who are the students, what are their needs, and they've developed a very innovative program. And this, I believe, is their second year. So I'd like to show a video. This one is, is probably more important to kind of show and, and capture the work. The Center for Teaching and Learning is dedicated to the professional development of faculty and staff, collaborative community outreach, and the creation of interdisciplinary academic programming. We believe that in order to serve students better, we must first support creative and professional aspirations across our campus and throughout our community. It's from this commitment that the Summer Maestro program was born. During this seven day a week, immersive academic program, tenured and longtime expert faculty and staff collaborate in order to challenge each other and our students to take charge of their stories, to orchestrate and craft their own academic destiny. From history to health services, from financial aid to first year advising, each of us is dedicated to whole student success. Moreover, each week Maestro students had the opportunity to meet and learn from community leaders across the region. By the end of the summer, Maestros know what it takes to be successful college students. Better yet, they leave the program looking up, engaged citizens of the world. It's important for us to recognize what is available in our community and how that can be a learning lab or a studio to complement what we do on this campus. It really makes a difference in our success every day in terms of uh, how we connect with this university. The university has, is as important to the art center as the art center is to the university. The mission of Maestro really resonates with me. Uh, being able to provide opportunities and to equip them with the tools to complete that academic challenge. Parkview would not be the institution we are today without having this great asset in our community called CSU Pueblo. I myself am a first generation. They get a four-year college degree in my family and I think I can really relate to the program, uh, how important it is for these kinds of experiences. The opportunity to represent the Art Center and the work with the maestros to share that story, but also to open the door for them. I think it's just critical to where they'll go in their lives and the experiences that they'll get. Our relationship in place in terms of what we do for the community and what CSU Pueblo does for the community are incredibly significant individually, but when we work together, it's, it's even more amazing what we can accomplish. So what Maestro is, is a group of faculty and staff coming together with a level of intentionality where they are first focusing on the students. Who are the students that are about to be in the Maestro program and what is it that they need? Coming from Denver, I really didn't know Pueblo much. I came from far away, so when I came here, I knew absolutely nobody. I always thought college was like something that I could never reach or do. Being a first year generation student is really scary. I have a middle brother looking upon me to like answer his questions because he's the one coming next year. So it's a lot of pressure. And then you end up coming to the Maestro program and then you have professors that are like, I have answers for you. It was like 15 credit hours, you know, five weeks, easy. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> it's a lot and it's intense. It's definitely a lot more rigorous than I thought it was going to be. It was Monday through Friday. We went to class from 9 to 5. We would wake up early on Saturdays and go on excursions. Visiting the city, learning about Pueblo, and then on Sunday was tutors, tutors. <laughs> the writing room and the tutors who work there are a particularly useful resource because our tutors are trained to help introduce these students to those unique demands of writing for a college environment. I love it here so far. I love the master program. I love what it had to offer me. Having a paper due every week kept me on course. There was never a day where I could just sit and relax. I'm, I, and I like that because I like working every day because that means I know I have a goal to complete and a goal to reach. The best piece of advice I've gotten from this program is to take risks for new adventures. All my life I've kept to myself and never tried anything new. Now that I'm in college, my eyes have been opened up to the new experiences. I've been able to live with other people and even gotten to socialize more. I've learned how to kayak even though I'm terrified of water, and I've been able to hang out with my new friends. Thanks to this program, 
I have broken out of the cage that my fears have put me in. During this past five weeks, I have built many relationships. I got a whole new family, got new friends, got supportive adults that will be there with me uh, throughout the four years now. This program has really taught me to collaborate to graduate. You have to work together with your peers in order to be successful, and that's exactly what we did this summer. You got to work with other people to get to where you're going, especially if they're going to the same place. It makes it a lot easier to get where you're going. We had to trust each other. We had to communicate. It was great. I've never had anything like this before. And we are more of a group and we are more of a unit together. I'm Dr. Donna Satter Hodge. This is CSU Pueblo. And these are your CSU Pueblo Maestro Thunderwolves. I'm a CSU Pueblo Maestro Thunderwolf. I am a CSU Pueblo Maestro Thunderwolf. I'm a CSU Pueblo Maestro Thunderwolf. I'm a CSU Pueblo Maestro Thunderwolf. I'm a CSU Pueblo Maestro Thunderwolf. I am a CSU Pueblo Maestro Thunderwolf. I'm a CSU Pueblo Maestro Thunderwolf. I am 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 a CSU Pueblo Maestro Thunderwolf. I'd like to, uh, are there any, st I know one student is here from Maestro. Are there? Would you please stand so we can, any students from Maestro, please stand. Good. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. I'd also, everyone who is involved in Maestro this summer, would you please stand so we can recognize you, including Dustin Hodge, please stand. All Maestro. Uh, so that is, the learning systems, and what we'll leave that, I wanna move on to the support systems very quickly. Um, equally important is making sure that we've got a support system, the academic support, the social support, the financial support, the co-curricular and the, the, the athletic domain um, that is critical to our university. Making sure the diversity and inclusion is always front and center. Bringing family engagement as a, as a bigger piece of what we do at CSU Pueblo, and then cultural programming. These two pieces together, along with our pathways. Our pathways are critical, and this is where we're gonna be spending a lot of our time this semester. Rather than me being out working with donors in the first semester uh, of the fall semester, I'm gonna be working with superintendents and principals in our local communities, and bringing you into the school systems and working to create a college-going culture um, to, with our, our, our local school systems, along with uh, working with Patty Erjavik at our community college system. And then the CSU piece. If we get this right and do this well, there are students who are in, uh, enrolling for Global or for Fort Collins who would be better served here. And so it is figuring out how do we work as a system and how can we benefit from students who uh, we would serve better uh, with this significant market differentiation that we can work uh, to develop. So the learning systems, I'm going to need a lot of faculty support in developing that in the student affairs and um, faculty for the students uh, for the support systems as well. So I've shared my story. We've talked a little bit about your story, where you've been, our story that we can create. And to do that, I've talked about the context. What are, what are the challenges in front of us? What are the opportunities? The opportunities are huge. And I want to re-articulate, if we don't take the opportunities, other, other providers will. And I want us to be at the leading edge of that. We talked about the chapters that we can develop together. There's seven of them. Employee compensation is always going to be one that I'm, I'm committed, and I want you to know that I'm committed to working on that. And then the other two are chapter one, which has this degree of urgency, which is working on university performance. And that is the enrollment, the retention, the graduation rates, and the placement. Chapter two, we begin in the spring semester, which is working and wrapping our heads around the, the differentiated vision that will uh, position us in the marketplace. So our call to action is, is, is quite simple, to develop students to their fullest potential, every student, every day. Um, each of us are engaged in a variety of conversations every day with our students. Those conversations need to be meaningful and purposeful, and they are. I just never want you to, to uh, um, forget the power of a relationship in terms of a, of, of a student making a decision to retain with us, to complete with us. It is about the relationship. And um, 
And I just, this is what we do, and this is a former institution that I was a part of. Um, this, the, you, you, keep, you keep the fundamentals front and center. Never underestimate this piece. This is the relationships we develop with each, other's, with each other and with our students. So I look forward to writing the story with all of you. We are co-authors on this journey, and um, I look forward to that very quickly about what's happened at, at the University of Virginia. Uh, Teresa Sullivan, for those of you who have followed her career, President Sullivan, she's been through a lot um, with the board who tried to oust her, and she remained, and now um, she's got this going on, what happened over the weekend that I, I believe all of you are familiar with. Um, the white supremacists marched on her campus and in the community. One is dead, and I think uh, there is about, I think, 12 that are injured to a variety of different degrees. Um, what I want all of you to understand and to know is that um, any form of violence on this campus is, is not going to be tolerated. Um, zero tolerance on that. And in terms of the hate speech, um, voicing hate speech on our campus would be inconsistent with our values. And I'm going to leave it with that. Um, you know, the First Amendment is alive and well, and it's important to me, it's important to you, and, um, and I believe this campus is sensitive to that, and we need to be sensitive to that. Um, we need to be open to a variety of different opinions, but I'm just going to re-articulate, voicing hate would be inconsistent with our values, and I looked at our values on our website, and I like them. Thank you. So our, our values, they're from, they're from the website. We are accountable to each other. We promote civic responsibility. We employ a customer focus. We promote freedom of expression. We demonstrate diversity and inclusiveness in all things that we do. We encourage and reward innovation. We act with integrity and mutual respect. We provide opportunity and access and we support the excellence in teaching and research. These are our values that have been a part of this institution for a long time. They are first and foremost on our website when we talk about our vision, our, our mission, and our values. And so violence is not going to be tolerated. Any form and um, voicing hate speech would be inconsistent with the values of the institution that I have inherited um, from all of you and President Leslie DeMar. Um, I've been in touch with her. I wished her well today, and uh, we had a great conversation last night, and she sends her regards um, to all of you today. So I look forward to having you as my colleague, and I look forward uh, to the story that we're about to write and to build on this lovely story that you've already started, um, but we've got, a, um, we've got a, a big one in front of us. Thank you very much, and have a great semester. Thank you.